Okay, we're on to the final stanza of bayonet charge. So just a quick recap on what you've seen so far. We've got the uh, incessant pace of the first stanza that is established through the very first adverb suddenly that were plunged into this chaotic frenetic quick battle the unnatural soldier plunged into becoming part of the weaponry of war he's become dehumanized and then just for a moment in the second stanza that pause that slowing down that really crucial rhetorical question before we're thrown back again into the chaos of the bayonet charge, okay? And we left it just at a caesura at the end of the second stanza. And the caesura was there, if you remember, just to finish that moment of pause before we go back into the chaos of the charge. So we're going to start with, then the shot slashed furrows, threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out. He plunged past with bayonet toward the green hedge, king, honour, human dignity, etc. dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. Let's start with that enjambement. We talked, I think, in the first part about enjambement suggesting all the speed of events. It's quick. It's happening all at once. There's that sense of pace and chaos that uh, is, is uncontrollable. And again, from stanza two to stanza three, that moment of pause and straight back into that, that pace reflected in the enjambement. The, the shot slashed furrows. Um, threw up a yellow hair. So what we've got now is the image of a hare, uh, you know, like a rabbit type creature, a large rabbit type creature. It has two possible inferences, this particular image, threw up the yellow hair. So firstly, is Ted Hughes talking literally about the impact on a yellow hair? So that hair itself would become uh, a symbol of nature and the impact of nature um, from the the war um, and we've got there the imagery of pain crawled in a threshing circle threshing its its limbs sort of uh, involuntarily moving all over the place in pain its mouth wide open silent its eyes standing out so very similarly to to remains if you you think back to that poem from simon armitage you've got the images of um agony of pain and if that's the case, then it's suggesting that nature itself is in pain. This one hair is, is a symbol for the destruction of nature by humans in warfare. But we could look at it in a more metaphorical way. Is the yellow hair not actually literally the animal? Could it be that it's a metaphor for a soldier who's a coward? Uh, yellow is an image, a colour often associated with, with cowardice. And so possibly it's um, suggesting that the, the soldier of the poem has become so dehumanised, he's insensitive to the pain of this maybe coward uh, who has been shot and is in pain and thinks perhaps that um, pain itself is, is unnecessary in warfare. So maybe it's a, an element of that dehumanization of the soldier himself. Personally, I like to think of it because of Ted Hughes's themes on nature and because then you've got some other images and poems that you can link to. I think it's more on the literal level, but if you wanted to go to that metaphorical reading of it, you, you can do. So we've got the, the, the yellow hair there. He plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge. Now, plunged past, that in itself is the idea of ignoring it. So again, we could link that to either of the two interpretations. Firstly, he could be ignoring the destruction of nature. It's not interest uh, to him at all because he's just in that instinctive charge towards his enemy. Equally, he could be ignoring the, the pleas of a, a fellow soldier um, who's been shot because he has got to become that machinery of war. He has got to move on and, and fight the enemy. So that idea of plunging past, but also plunged as a verb, is both 
uh, a positive in terms of uh, his confidence in just going past, plunged past. It's dynamic, it's quick. It could also suggest he's a little bit out of place there. It could suggest, again, like that stumbling in the first stanza, that he's perhaps not quite in control. He's still a little bit awkward. So again, an interesting image to look at. Passed with his bayonet toward the green hedge. And again, we've got Hughes interweaving nature and warfare. The green hedge becomes a symbol for the enemy. That's where the enemy are hidden. And it's man using nature um, as part of the machinery of warfare. Next couple of lines are interesting. King, honour, human dignity, etc. Drop like luxuries. Now remember back in the first stanza, we talked about the patriotic tear that becomes molten iron. So the tear is a symbol of emotion and the patriotism is one of the reasons that the soldiers signed up to the war. Now, all of those reasons that he signed up to the war have been dropped like luxury. So, to fight for the king, no longer relevant. To fight for honour, no longer relevant. To fight for human dignity, no longer relevant. And all of the irrelevance of that is summed up in this phrase, etc. We would usually see that as ETC and so on. So they don't really matter. Etc. means that none of this really matters. All of those um, idealistic ideas um, of why he fought in the first place are not important anymore and that simile dropped like luxuries they're dropped they're forgotten about they're cast away like luxuries something luxury is um, something that we don't necessarily need so he's feeling that king honor and human dignity all of that is no longer needed to him what is his reason for fighting now it is simply to survive it is simply fighting out of instinct it's another way of showing that he's become dehumanized he's part of the machinery of war but there's still that hint of humanity that he actually has an instinct to survive and perhaps he's more like an animal in that way than he is like a human being just living on his wits to survive the war drop like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air his terrors touchy dynamite some really nice imagery by hughes at the end there the blue crackling air so you've got the sense of um blue skies perhaps but also blue that that sense of electricity that sense of sparkle the crackling of the bullets we've already had some sound imagery in the first stanza uh, smacking the belly out of the air and for me this image isn't necessarily the blue skies it's more the blue electricity of um, bullets and gunfire and ammunition crackling in the air blue crackling air it's as if the whole surroundings to them have become dangerous even the air itself his terrors touchy dynamite now this is our key quote for this particular part and i always talk about how conclusions are important they are the last thing the poet wants us to think about his terrors touchy dynamite so this could be a number of things let's focus first of all on the uh the fact that maybe the soldier's fear is ignited by the blue crackling air so i've just talked about how the air itself is dangerous there's bullets there's shells, there's all sorts flying about that are dangerous to the soldier. So the air itself has become dangerous. And maybe his fear has been ignited by that blue crackling air. So that becomes his terrors, touchy dynamite. He himself could explode um, in amongst that dangerous air. Or is it a link to shell shock? In World War I, shell shock was extremely common among soldiers, and it's like a post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that's what initially it was called. Uh, the idea that um, sounds in normal life would spark terror. And maybe the terror's touchy dynamite is the long-lasting effect of the war on the soldiers so that he's left with lasting shell shock, left with this lasting trauma, that, that noises and sudden movements continue to alarm him beyond this particular warfare. Or, a third interpretation, um, is the terror dynamite, is the soldier himself the danger, his terror's touchy dynamite. So remember that he has become part of the machinery of war, so his terror 
his fear means that he can lash out at anything. Remember, he's got a bayonet on his arm. So if he's alarmed, if he's um, worried or stressed at any point, he becomes instantly touchy. So his reaction is to lash out, to stab. So the soldier himself is the danger. So it could be any of those interpretations. It could be that the crackling around him makes him feel dangerous, or it could be the shell shock, or it could be that the soldier himself, because he's part of the machinery of war, is dangerous. He can lash out at any moment. Also notice that the terror's touchy is an alliteration of the T plosives. Whenever you talk about alliteration, you can't just identify that particular feature. You can't just say Heaney or Hughes or Armitage or whatever. You can't just say they use alliteration. In this case, Hughes is using alliteration for a particular purpose. In any case, a poet is using alliteration for a particular purpose. So we've got to think about what that purpose would be. Now, Ted Hughes has chosen t sounds. T -t. And again, they're plosives, like the k from, from the cold clockwork. The t is a plosive sound. It sounds a little bit like the crackling air. This terror's touchy dynamite. But a plosive sound, a sound that almost explodes from the mouth, is totally in keeping with the idea that the soldier himself is part of the danger. It's totally in keeping with the idea that there's explosions happening all around him. Those little explosive sounds completely reflect the electric crackle of the air that is causing the danger or of the soldier himself being part of that danger. So where do we link bayonet charge? Links really nicely with Charge of the Light Brigade because you've got charge in the title and you've got a real contrast there behind um, the, the sort of honour that's presented in Charge of the Light Brigade and the sort of dehumanising effect that is presented in Bayonet Charge. But you have got a little bit of dehumanising within uh, Charge of the Light Brigade when you've got the repetition of the there's not to. Um, there's not to reason why there's but to do and die in Charge of the Light Brigade. The symbol of theirs becoming um, part of a larger army rather than individuals themselves and that sense of collective um, responsibility of, of not being individuals is really brought out in Charge of the Light Brigade and in Bayonet Charge too. It's a poem about the First World War so it links really well with exposure and so you've got the experiences of, of the soldiers in both. You've got more emotion coming through exposure than you've got here. But in both, you've got the sense that soldiers are no longer um, beings, but part of a larger machinery. In exposure, that sense of them being disposable, that sense of them being easily lost to the weather um, and nobody caring about it, nothing happening. In this, you've got a much more... Um, speedy poem a sense of pace but equally that inherent danger in the danger in bayonet charge obviously from the um the gunfire whereas an exposure it's more uh, the exposure to the weather that's uh, that's important there but remember within your comparisons you can contrast and compare so it goes nicely with those in actual fact bayonet charge could go with uh, war photographer or particularly with remains that sense that we've talked about here of shell shock post-traumatic stress disorder which is absolutely inherent to remains but is touched upon in war photographer it could go with kamikaze in effect it fits with any of those from the anthology that is really linked to war and conflict